Welcome to Get Naked with Dr. Kate. I'm your host, Dr. Kate Balistrieri, a Beverly Hills-based psychologist, certified sex therapist, and the founder of Modern Intimacy. Thanks for joining me here where I talk about sex, relationships, mental health, and dive into your questions with practical answers and real solutions. Each week, I share insights aimed at helping you build an authentic and healthy relationship with yourself, with others, and with your sexuality. It's time to get naked emotionally, mentally, and on your own time, physically. Hi, everyone. This week on the podcast, I'm going to start with a listener question. And this person writes in and says, Hi, Dr. Kate, my partner and I have been in a long term relationship for 12 years. Lately, I've been having fantasies about her having sex with other men while I watch and I can't participate. Is this what they call cuckolding? Or is this called hot wifing? is it okay that I want to do this with her? Can you help? And I love this question so much. It's one that I get a lot about cuckolding and hot wifery. There seems to be a lot of mystery around this kind of kink and this kind of play. So today I've brought on the podcast, Heather Shannon to have a conversation with me about it. And Heather is a certified sex therapist, the host of the top ranked Ask a Sex Therapist podcast. And with over 12 years in private practice, Heather has been helping queer, kinky, and or non-monogamous folks to explore who they are as sexual beings and how they wanna show up in their relationships. Heather's been featured in so many different publications like Cosmopolitan, Women's Health, Self Magazine, and on podcasts such as The Horny Housewife and Curious Girl Diaries. Heather is the sex and relationship expert for the Peanut app, which serves 2.5 million women throughout all stages of life. Heather, thanks for being here with me today. Thank you so much for having me. I'm excited to be here, and I'm glad we were able to kind of actually connect over social media. It's nice when that happens, Um, and I'm excited about our topic. Me too. Me too. Have you worked with many folks who have explored cuckoldry or hot wifery? Yeah. I mean... Cuckolding in particular seems to get brought up a lot, and it seems to be one that there's a lot of discomfort around. So I'm not surprised by the the listener question mm-hmm. that you got. Um, I think there's a lot of sort of, is this okay? Is this weird? I've also had people who have you know brought it up to me, but were really afraid to bring it up to their partner and just kind of judging themselves a lot. So um, hopefully we can at least kind of remove the shame and stigma from it. Although there's also the element, sometimes people like the shame feeling <laughs> yeah. and that's part of the arousal. <laughs> right, right. Yes, let's remove the shame yeah. that others impose and invite the shame that is kinky and there fun. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so right. let's break, let's mm-hmm. dive into that. I think that's a good entry point to talk about what cuckolding is and what it isn't. So what? how do you define cuckolding? Let's start there. Yeah, I'll kind of, and I might define it a little bit in juxtaposition to hot wifing because I think that Mm -hmm. might help too. Um, So for me, the cuckolding is when, like if you're the guy, like the person who asked the question, you know, your female partner or wife is going to be sexual with another man and there's kind of the element of maybe he's more masculine or maybe he has a bigger penis or maybe he's just going to satisfy her in, you know, ways that I can't. Or maybe there's also just like getting to watch, um, you know, and see how sexual she is and see the prowess of this other man, you know? So it's, it's almost kind of playing with being emasculated, which I think is really interesting. Um, Whereas the hot wife kink is not so much about the emasculation or the shame. And it's more about, you know, really enjoying how sexual your partner is. And maybe that, you know, she can't be satisfied by just one man. And there's almost like a a voyeuristic part, maybe of both of them. But with the hot wifing, you know, that pleasure of the voyeuristic part can really come in. And that could be whether you're physically present or whether you just kind of get to hear about her exploits and, you know, be turned on by that. I think you highlight a really interesting mm-hmm. point around the role that humiliation can play between cuckolding and hot wifing. And with hot wifing, there's really this sense of 
joining and and pride and celebration of your partner's sexuality mm-hmm. without that experience of yeah. feeling emasculated. In fact, many men who enjoy hot wifing feel a sense of confidence bolstered when their wife is really sexual with other totally. people or their partner and then comes yes. back to them and wants them too. And it becomes a shared space yes. of like celebrating all of that erotic charge that lives there and knowing that totally. she wants to come back to him and choose him every time too. Yes. You're so right. Like when I talk to men about this, there is often that uh, aspect of like, you know, maybe she's been sexual with all these other people, but then I'm the last one. I'm, I'm the one that she comes back to, or, you know, if it's more of like a gangbang scenario or something, it's like, okay, I'm the final one, you know? Um, or there's an element of even like sharing the partner, you know, like, and like you said, there's the pride element of that. Like my partner is so sexy and all these other men want her, but like, I'm the one she comes home to, you know? Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And with cuckolding, let's, let's dive in a little bit to that process of, like you yeah. said, chosen emasculation. So how does the humiliation piece play out? And why is that erotic for some men? It's a great question. <laughs> if someone could actually answer, like, why do we have any of our sexual interests? I mean, I think we've got pieces of it. You know, we kind of have some good theories, but um, really I'm like, who knows? But I do think with anything kinky, there's kind of the playing with societal norms. And so there's this idea that, you know, a man is supposed to want to be the most like virile and the most, you know, have the most prowess and be super alpha and, you know, leader and so sexy and desirable. And so it does seem subversive, you know, Mm -hmm. to kind of be like, no, I'm going to be the beta. (laughs) I'm going to let someone else do that. And I'm going to like get to witness that. And I'm going to be kind of put in my place maybe a little bit. And it's almost like, then this is my take. I'm curious what your take is. It's almost like the the man who's the cuckold is kind of feeling like she's too good for me. Mm-hmm. There's a little bit of that, oh, she's too good for me. See, it's it's being proven in front of my face. Um, but you know, I think I think of the phrase like shame boner. It's like the whole phrase shame boner exists because in general, humans can get off from humiliation or from degradation. Um, and I, I do think a lot of it is just the subversiveness of it. It's like, because we're not supposed to. And anything that's taboo, mm-hmm. uh, you know, Jack Marin talks about this in The Four Cornerstones of Eroticism, which is a great book. It's an old book, but it's a good one. And so one of the cornerstones is things that are taboo, you know? And I, I think that's one that we probably all like in different ways. I would agree. I think there there is a lot of power in the subversive. And for so many men, they they don't really get to play with humiliation or shame in their day-to-day lives in a way that is mm-hmm. really accessible or even tolerable because so many men live in um, so true. Kind of a, a, a psychological prison of having to always appear completely um, yeah. intact and strong and uh, composed. Mm-hmm. So I think it gives them a space to really safely play with fears around, am I good enough for her? And so true. Yeah. And, and is there another man who's more potent, more virile, stronger than I am? And yeah. I think it's a really interesting space for men to play with those feelings and those thoughts in this consensual way, because I think it gives them the ability to trust then that their partnership is really secure when their partner does choose Hmm. them at the end of the day. That's a good point. So maybe that's another thing that, you know, the cuckolding and the hot wife thing have in common. The partner still comes home to you, even though you just played with the idea that you're a lesser man, Mm -hmm. you know, which is kind of fascinating. Yeah. Um, And as you were talking, I just thought of two more ideas. (laughs) Oh, do share. Um, So one of them, I think, and this, this can be generalized a bit for any kind of, you know, like really submissive or like degradation or humiliation play in general, I think there's a real freedom to it. You know, it's like as we go about our lives, there's so much pressure to, you know, be productive and move up the corporate ladder or grow your business or, you know, be the most fit you can possibly be and, you know, be the best lover you can possibly be. And so I think when you're really playing with the flip side of that, it's just like, I can just be a total mess and have a great time, (laughs) you know? And I'm like, oh yeah, that seems like a pressure release valve for sure. 
Oh, definitely, definitely. Being in that cuckold role allows people to not have to perform, right? They get to serve in different ways. Yeah. They watch. It's like a psychological edging of sorts because they're waiting mm. to to play or they're waiting to be seen and they're they're kind of in agony watching their partner have all of this pleasure, yeah. but they really like it. They like having to wait and <laughs> and not being able to engage in it. And there is a freedom in that. There's a lot of freedom from having to be that powerful, phallic, um, you know, activated man. And and I think there's mm-hmm. a gift in that. I think so too. Because it's like, how many men are naturally just like super alpha and like that's easy for them? You know, I think it's kind of become more of this standard to strive for, but like men are just humans. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. None of us really have it figured out. Totally. I don't even like supporting that language of alpha and beta because it's been Mm -hmm. so, first of all, the studies around that have been debunked. And the the original author Mm -hmm. of the study who coined that language, alpha came out and said, yikes, I made a mistake. None of these phenomena exist in the wild. It was all a farce. Yeah. Nice to hear. It is. It is. Yeah. So now that language, but it's of something alpha, that's been kind of used against men. Of course, yeah, and and I feel like men yeah. have really taken to this hierarchical positioning of I better be alpha, and and that's what a patriarchy demands of men: a, a subjugation of anything mm-hmm. tender and nurturing, and hmm. um, you know, sensitive. And and so I think a lot of men do feel really entrapped by this expectation that they should just be forever the top dog, whatever that, I don't even like that language Mm -hmm. because that's been co-opted by really exploitative people like Andrew Tate. But um, (laughs) (laughs) I was also thinking that. (laughs) Yeah. But, but, but case in point right here, uh, men who embody that sort of really um, hurtful and harmful uh, opinion about what men should be, um, set this impossible standard for men. And then they Mm -hmm. don't know how to express these other parts of themselves. And I think that the cuckolding space is a way that they can lean into something that is just completely opposite. I agree. It's kind of, so I think of it a little bit as like, they're like an eager puppy in the cuckolding scenario. <laughs> like, you, you know, it's like just waiting for their turn, you know? Mm-hmm. Like, oh, that looks so fun. I want to play. <laughs> I can't. Right. But I can't. I have to wait. Um, or I, I get to clean yeah. up when they're done. It's like they get to enjoy mm-hmm. the second the second round of whatever's kind of left and given to them as as pieces mm-hmm. of enjoyment. That's true. And I can see, I mean, we talk a lot about sexual tension and like what a great way to build up sexual tension within yourself, mm-hmm. you know, sort of having this craving but not acting on it. It's like you're just keeping – like you said, the psychological edging. It's like that tension is just like mounting. Mm-hmm. What do you think it's like for women in that role, whether they're engaging in the cuckolding fantasy or the hot wife fantasy? How would it be different? It's interesting because – I think there's going to be some women who are just excited that they don't have to be monogamous. But I've also, you know, seen it happen with couples where the husband is kind of pushing this agenda and the wife actually felt more pressured into it and ultimately didn't want that, Mm -hmm. you know? So I I think at the end of the day, the wife does need to have some of her own desire um, because, you know, I think there's an element of like compersion, right? It's like we get off on our partner getting off, you know, we get off on their pleasure and, you know, maybe seeing them with another person or even just seeing your husband or partner, you know, being turned on by this scenario might be enough. But yeah, there could also be kind of the playing with the power dynamic, Mm -hmm. uh, more so with the cuckolding, Mm -hmm. you know, where it's like, okay, I'm going to put him in his place or everything he's done that's pissed me off this week or whatever (laughs) this month, this is now going to be like his punishment. But like how cool that we can kind of transform it into like a fun punishment, you know, punishment, if you will. Um, So I think playing with those dynamics, playing with being, you know. Uh, things are changing, obviously, societally in terms of gender roles, but still playing with a female, being the female and being more in charge or, you know, um, getting to call the shots. Yeah. I mean, the, the word cuckold originated with, uh, I, I believe, as a term that was used to describe a man who didn't know that his wife was cheating on him. And 
um, to really like yes. speak to that humiliating component. So taking that that power back consciously within a partnership can really be transformative to, as you said, like work out some of the power mm-hmm. things that might be going on between the two of them or some of the frustrations in a really healthy way. Um, if they're both really, if if they're in the know about that and consenting to that conscious restoration, um, can cuckolding Mm -hmm. or hot wifing exist in the reverse or with folks who are in queer relationships? Oh yeah. Yeah. So how would we, how would we conceptualize? Yeah. How would we conceptualize that and sort of take it out of the originating heteronormative frame that it kind of was born in? Oh, I love this question. Um, I mean, for me, it's all about the energy and the dynamic, right? And so like that doesn't really need to have a gender. So you can think about who do you want to see your partner with, (laughs) you know, Mm -hmm. Um, who's your partner attracted to, of course. Um, Certainly the hot wifing thing, it it is interesting that the names of it are a bit gendered. I feel Mm -hmm. like maybe we need to like update the names of the kink somehow, Um, because you you don't really hear hot husbanding. <laughs> it doesn't no. roll off the tongue quite as well. But um, maybe we'll but, invent a new word one day. If anyone listening has one, let us know. <laughs> but yeah, the same idea. So just enjoying your partner being highly sexual, you know, being insatiable, um, getting to watch them be so sexy, getting to watch someone else please them maybe in different ways than what you normally do, which literally any other human is going to probably please them in a somewhat different way just Mm -hmm. because they're a different human. Mm -hmm. Um, So I think that side seems kind of easier. There are cut queens, you know, Mm -hmm. that that is a a word that I hear in the kink community. And so the same idea where, you know, you can swap the genders and see your male partner with somebody. Now, in a queer relationship where maybe – a partner is non-binary or maybe they're pansexual, you know, like I wouldn't get, I really wouldn't get caught up on the gender part of it. I would right. just say like, do, do the same things where you're, you're kind of, you know, left to sit in the corner and watch and not allowed to play. And you're seeing your partner with someone else who's maybe kind of hot and a little bit intimidating for you in that way. And, you know, they're kind of going to town having fun and you're still left to kind of clean up the mess as you mentioned earlier, Kate, or, you know, be, you know, you have to wait your turn till, till they're mm-hmm. done and that person leaves. And then you kind of, you know, serve your partner in some way. Mm-hmm. Yeah. What are your thoughts? Like, do you, what do you think about making it genderless? Yeah. I, I think it is important to reframe it as genderless because it, it really is about power and it's about yeah. having a, a way to play with those power dynamics. And if you have positioned yourself in a way where you feel one up or one down, um, right. And topping mm-hmm. or bottoming, it's, it's sort of an extension mm-hmm. of being able to be in one of those different roles. And that can play yeah. out no matter the gender of the partners in any dynamic so it, it is about like exploring how do we how do we change roles? How do we change our way mm. of relating to each other and our practice of worthiness mm-hmm. with one another? And I think that that is mm. a really fun space for couples to play in because when we there's just a lot of unconsciousness that that can happen in the day to day of relationships. We habituate to each other we get lost in the everyday things that we have to do. And so going into a kink like this can be a really healthy way to say, you know what, let's be more conscious about how we negotiate power together and how we explore that and how it's connected to our sense of worth together and how we reclaim each Mm -hmm. other when we feel like something has been disrupted or different or not being in a state of equilibrium. And I'm thinking back to the original question too, and how <laughs> you and I are like unusually comfortable having this conversation, <laughs> like, I think, <laughs> probably by virtue of our careers somewhat. Mm-hmm. But, um, you know, like the average person maybe has not really explored this a ton or doesn't talk to people about it for a living. So um, it's making me just think about like, what are some of the you know, common concerns that might come up with having this conversation, Mm -hmm. you know, especially if you haven't had super open sexual communication with your partner before and and have held some things back. What are some of the things that you think partners who want to engage in this play 
should be thinking about with each other before they actually do it? That's a good question. Um, I'm a huge fan of starting slow Mm -hmm. (laughs) with things um, because it is a risk to the relationship. You don't know how you're going to react really until you're in the situation. So I would just say like maybe you just go to like a swingers club first and just kiss other people and then process, okay, how do we feel about that? Like maybe define what's something that's in that direction that we want to head in, but it's like a much smaller version and we don't just go like 10 out of 10 right away. Maybe you're just like so secure, you don't even care and you know you're not going to be jealous or you have enough experience that you know how you're going to react, fine. But for people who have more of the nervousness and hesitation, I kind of feel like pick something (laughs) bite-sized and start with that, you know? Yeah, I I love that. And yeah, I agree 100%. I think it's, you can't unring a bell. So I think it's important to be gradual Mm -hmm. in how you explore whatever you're going to do when you expand your partnership. So it might be uh, great to start by going to a swingers club or a sex club. If that even feels like too big of a step, you can explore some audio or video or even written um, erotic material so that you can get a sense of like, wow, we can fantasize that we are these characters and and you can watch for the characters, Mm -hmm. nonverbal reactions and, and, or their descriptions of what they're experiencing. I think reading up on chat forums is a great Mm -hmm. way to also think about and learn from the wisdom that of other partners who have played in this space Um, to even get you thinking about like, what, what do we want to do to really secure our partnership as we expand into yeah. inviting others into it? You know, some couples want to be with partners that they know and that they trust and that they have a mm-hmm. sense of um, ongoing platonic relationship with, and that feels safer for them. And other folks prefer mm-hmm. engaging in, with people who are anonymous, who they will never have to see again, and they don't even know their names. And right. Both of those are okay. I think you just have to really get clear on what creates safety for the partners involved and, and then go really, really gently into that direction. That's a great point. Because yeah, now I'm realizing that mine was probably at least a five out of 10. (laughs) So maybe it's like, what is the one or two out of 10? And it could even just be Yeah, like, let's explore this as a fantasy. And so many people feel so satisfied and turned on exploring it as a fantasy. Like not Mm -hmm. everything that gets you hot and bothered needs to be done in real life, you know? Um, So play with that. And I did have a client where that was the case for him. And I think he was wondering, you know, there's a lot of people wondering, like, is something wrong with me, which is part of the question that um, your listener asked. And so I do want to just say, no, nothing is wrong with you, you know? But that said, pay attention to how you feel. Um, you know, and one of the things I wanted to mention, so I'm an internal family systems therapist. And so we talk a lot about parts. And I think when it comes to kink in particular, but also just sex in general, we have a lot of exiled parts. And so these are parts of our ego or psyche that kind of get like banished into the dark basement corner. And so it could be parts that feel not good enough, unlovable, like a failure. And so we're kind of taking these more vulnerable parts that don't often see the light of day, kind of like taking them out to play. And so there can be, you know, some more emotional hangover. I think talking about aftercare can become extra important when we're Mm -hmm. kind of playing with these really sensitive exiled parts. And I also think doing the work to create as much healing as possible is important. Um, When I was at University of Michigan doing the sexual health certificate program, uh, I think it was Dr. Joe Court, who uh, is going to be on my podcast soon. (laughs) He was talking, I think, about trauma play. What was it? I don't know if it was like king play versus trauma play. But the, the idea was there was a difference between are you kind of re-traumatizing yourself, you know, almost like creating more of like a wound Mm -hmm. or is it kind of like that's pretty much healed and now it can be done in a way that's more purely pleasurable. And so if you're finding yourself having a really mixed feeling, find an IFS therapist, find a sex therapist and, you know, do some work on that. And they they even have um, like IFS self-healer groups too Mm. that, you know, are super affordable if you want to kind of just start exploring some of that. Oh, that's a really good resource. I didn't know that that existed. The self-support or the... Yeah, I'll I'll send some links to it. Okay, yeah, please. We'll include those in our show notes. Um, 
Cool. Yeah, I, I do think what you said is really important here. It, it, playing in this space can create a lot of mixed emotions. There can be high euphoric feelings. There can be lots of healing and closeness. And it, mm-hmm. closeness does sound paradoxical when you think about kind of what exactly is happening with partners inviting in a third <laughs> into their dynamic. Yeah. But it can mm-hmm. foster a lot of closeness and connection and resolve for some of those wounded parts that maybe exist inside deep dark in the in the psyche. But it also can bring up, mm-hmm. um, and I love your, your phrase, the emotional hangover, um, because that, that's a part that's saying, hey, I need a little bit more exploration. I need a little bit more voice. I need a little bit more holding to process through how yeah. vulnerable this can feel. And, and that's where the connection comes in when you can hold space for each other in that and heal and move through it in a way that's really compassionate and really empathic yeah. and just really caring. So that to me feels like the real gift of, of going into some of these areas of kink that maybe folks haven't thought about before as they continue to get deeper into their connection with one another you can get deeper in the ways that you grow and heal and resolve. And it's important to focus on the debriefing after. So I find that when couples take Mm. the time to be really intentional about what they might need after the play, after the scene is done, how might they want to just take time to be with each other and nurture one another and, and like just hold space for that. So thinking about, Mm -hmm. do you want to reclaim your partner? If you're together during the play, or Mm -hmm. if your partner goes out to play and then comes back home, what do you both need to feel like that's a contained practice? Does one of you need space to be alone with your feelings? Does one of you need to to talk about the details of the play? It's okay not to have the answer Mm -hmm. to those questions, but I highly encourage you to think about what might feel really... um, Mm-hmm. completing in the process. Yeah. That, I love everything you said. <laughs> um, <clears throat> I think it's such a good reminder that, you know, even if we're playing with these, because I also think kink is so misunderstood, mm-hmm. but, you know, when we're kind of playing with these kinky parts or we're playing with things like humiliation or degradation, it's important to remember like that is really vulnerable. And even if you're kind of purposely the third person being somewhat left out, You know, it can be connective because you're revealing a part of yourself that you don't normally reveal. And that part is being accepted and, you know, encouraged to be part of the play. Um, And I can imagine afterwards, you know, some people might want that reminder of like, okay, now the play is done. Kind of like you're mentioning, like we've created a container. It's like, okay, now the container is closing and you are good enough (laughs) and you are lovable. So maybe kind of having those reminders um, would be something to check with yourself and check with your partner. It's like, okay, is that what, where we need to go to kind of close the container? I really appreciate what you said about some kinks being really misunderstood or kink in general being misunderstood. Let's mm-hmm. go in a little bit more, if you don't mind on that, and how kink can be something that does enhance intimacy for folks. Oh, yeah. I mean, I have a few thoughts on this. So <laughs> One, I think if you get bored easily or if it's hard to shut your mind off, kink can be so great because there's just – to me, there's like a little more complexity to it mentally and it can really engage you so that you can truly have that freedom experience in your sexual encounter, whatever it is that you're doing. Um, It's like your mind is really like, okay, I've let go of all those pressure things and I'm fully in submissive mode and, you know, I'm present and I'm here and I'm not thinking about the laundry and I'm not wondering how long this is going to take. So it can help with presence, I think, in that way. Um, The other thing that I think is kind of misunderstood is a lot of times, you know, kink is not always about like penetration and orgasm, you know, like so much of kink really could be considered like mental foreplay or just foreplay in general. Mm -hmm. Um, You know, people might do an entire kink scene and it's just spanking, (laughs) you know, Um, or it's just, you know, being tied up. And rolled around while you're tied up or suspended in the air in sort of an artistic way. Mm -hmm. Um, So there's just so many 
directions that people can go with it. It's really, it's really kind of a playground. It's like, okay, here's all these ways you can be super creative. And, and of course, you know, being a therapist, the psychological component is just super fascinating to me. It's like, what are all the different ways you can feel during a sexual encounter? And I think kink just adds so many tools and resources to create different feelings. I agree. Okay. I want to say one more thing too. Okay. People, people assume kinky things or kinky people are super like hypersexual like all the time or something like that or very non-monogamous and that just doesn't have to be the case. Like right. sometimes, yeah, but sometimes no. Exactly. So sometimes people who are not kinky are also hypersexual or non-monogamous. And so I think really I just want people to understand like each human is just individual and complex and you just have to, you know, check your assumptions and take your time getting to know them. Absolutely. And, and each partner dynamic is unique and complex because then you're bringing together Mm -hmm. two folks Mm -hmm. and their individuality and their needs. And you're creating something in that moment, whether you're in a long-term partnership or whether it's a one-time play experience, it's like every single experience is its own blueprint that comes with lots of, lots of ingredients with which to play Mm -hmm. and create a, a really cool moment One of the things that I think makes kink so joining for folks is that it's really about trust building. There's so much communication Mm. and negotiation and agreement made before any scene takes place that it gives folks this way to be really collaborative and they agree on what are our, what are our stops? Um, How will I know if you're going to stop? Mm. So a safe word or a safe gesture is created so that, There's just all of this communication that goes into creating Mm -hmm. the experience and that implicitly in our bodies builds so much trust in a relational um, moment. And so I think it can be a really joining experience just in our bodies unconsciously and non-verbally because of all of that Mm -hmm. extra um, framing that takes place before any sex even happens. Absolutely. Even just hearing you say that, I was like, yes, I would feel so much more sort of safe and held knowing that this person cared, I think, to have these kind of pre-kink or pre-sex conversations. And I think that the kink community in general is very conscious about communication. Mm -hmm. doesn't mean every person who's kinky does that well, (laughs) but (laughs) I do think that Um, that's something that sort of the more non kink or vanilla community can take from the kink community is like, how can we have more of that pre-communication? How can we be and create a safe space for each other? Yeah. Yeah. I agree. Well, what would be maybe two suggestions that you have for people who are thinking about embarking and cuckolding and hot wifing on where they can even find Mm. information about it and, and start to educate themselves? (laughs) Podcasts. Um, I do think podcasts are great because we get to talk about the, the nuances a little bit more. Mm -hmm. And, um, I do think that, you know, cuckolding and hot wifing have become more popular. You Mm -hmm. know, I think that, uh, Justin Lee Miller mentioned cuckolding in particular in his book, Tell Me What You Want. So even may- maybe that one could be a resource for people. Um, I love that book. I think it was based on – it was a good book. It's very like normalizing. So if anyone listening has things you feel kind of uncomfortable about that you desire sexually, um, I think this book will help you feel better about that. So – you know, I have the advantage and you have the advantage, Kate, of like, we do this all the time. Yeah. So if you don't, like, it's important to realize just because people aren't talking about it openly with you doesn't mean they're not all thinking about it. Um, I think his book also said that like 96% of people have at least had a BDSM fantasy at some point in their life. So um, so it's, it's really pretty normal. If I remember right, in, in the research, the research in his book pulled something like 4,000 Americans and- yeah. It mm-hmm. was one of the largest um, studies on sexual behavior and interests um, yep. ever conducted. And I, I think, if I'm remembering this right, group sex was the number one fantasy. Yes, it was. <laughs> yeah. And this would constitute, yeah, this would constitute a form of group sex, having a third person mm-hmm. if you're present. Um, mm hmm. So it's it's a really common fantasy and and yeah. definitely I love what you said about just because folks aren't talking about it doesn't mean 
that they're not thinking about it or doing it. And that's so true. Totally. Yeah. Anything else you can think of in terms of aftercare or debriefing or anything that folks should touch base on together if they're going to play in this space? I think we gave some good general recommendations and guidelines. I think what I would say is to be patient, um, you know, that you might not get it right the first time, that you might realize the aftercare you thought you needed is not what you needed and you wind up feeling super emotional, you know, for 24 hours before you sort of recompose yourself. Um, So allow yourself, I mean, do your best, right? (laughs) Like allow yourself to be in the process and not have it all figured out immediately. Allow yourself to change and shift in terms of like what you want compared to what you thought you wanted. Um, So it is a bit of a trial and error process, I think. And, you know, I do think do your research, though, and have as many conversations as possible. And like we said, the ba- I think the baby stepping is important if you're really looking to minimize kind of the risk to your connections and um, and I think just your mental health and stability. And, you know, especially with those exiled parts, I would say, like, go go get a good therapist and do some of that work first. Yeah, I'm, I'm a huge fan of that piece of advice. I think it, even for couples who want to get into this work, it can be super helpful to work with a sex therapist and be really mm-hmm. thoughtful and intentional because when you're embarking in any kind of yeah. new area of play, there's just a lot that you don't know you don't know. And having right. the, the knowledge of a sex therapist to help guide you can really be super protective in, in setting a strong yeah. foundation for a successful experience. I think so too. I mean, look at me and Kate. We're pretty nice. <laughs> we are. And we like know some things and we'll help you. <laughs> Amazing. Um, where can folks yeah. find you, Heather, if they do want to work with you? Yeah, for sure. Um, so my website is just my name, heathershannon.co. Um, and if you go to my freebies tab, I do have a kink personas gift for people. So if you're just curious about some of the different kink roles and want to just start getting some ideas, you can check that out. And then obviously my podcast, Ask a Sex Therapist with Heather Shannon. Amazing. Thank you so much for joining me today for this conversation. It was so fun. It was so fun. Thanks for having me, Kate. Of course. All right, everyone. See you next week. Thank you for listening to Get Naked with Dr. Kate. Stay connected with me on Instagram and TikTok at Dr. Kate Balistrary. Everyone has questions and I want to answer as many as I can. So feel free to email your questions to question at getnakedpodcast.com. If you're looking for a free 30-minute consultation with me or someone on my team, visit modernintimacy.com. And don't forget to join our newsletter, Modern Intimacy, on Substack. Let's meet back here next week. A new episode drops every Tuesday. Disclaimer, this podcast is not a substitute for therapy and does not constitute a professional relationship with Dr. Kate Balistrieri or Modern Intimacy. This podcast is strictly for education and entertainment purposes only.